Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY, that's 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age and eligibility varies by jurisdiction. Void in New Hampshire, Oregon, and Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. For additional terms and responsible gaming resources, see dkng.co slash football. Welcome, Bear Bets, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Score big with DraftKings Sportsbook, the best place to bet touchdowns. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the code Bear Bets. It's good Bear Bets for new customers to get two hundred dollars in bonus bets. I am your host, the Bear Chris Felica, joined again by Chef Schwartz, as I am every week. Sammy P and Will Hill will join us in the gambling group chat in a few minutes. Uh, a couple of a couple of winning, a couple of best bet winners, right? Oh no. Do we have a best bet winner for me last week, Jeff, or no? Okay. I, uh, no, my, uh, uh, LSU's defense. LSU, I, I, yeah, LSU never forgot again. to play defense. It's, never, but you won never everything again. Else. Never I, hit, hit I my hate fade. when that happens. Hit my fade. Never again, never again do I bet an LSU's defense bear. But I will like to announce that unlike L, uh, unlike UNLV starting quarterback, I, I, did, I did get paid to show up today. My check is cleared, and I am yeah. uh, glad that my employer has honored the contract that I may or may not have agreed to. No one really knows, but uh, I'm here to talk <laughs> to you about college football and, of course, the gambling group chat that we'll do in a little bit. How about that story, Bear, from yeah. uh, the, this morning as we taped this on a Wednesday? Uh, the messy world of, of NIL, but this is a t- – Bear, I know you're going to talk about this in, in a couple of days with, with Bruce. The overriding point I want to make – is that this is messy on a smaller scale. Like the, the Power 5 programs bear, this is locked down, right? It's locked down. Yep. They have contracts. They have great NIL collectives. But this is going to be messy, the Group of Five level, where it's not quite as organized. There's not as much money to go around. And I'll just say this to the players. Sign your contracts, okay? Verbal agreements from coaches are not binding, Coaches do not know what's happening with the collectives. They're not supposed to bear, right? They're not no, part right. of this. So, athletes, sign your contracts, man. Yeah, I, I just know, and I, and knowing I, of what we're going to talk about as the, as the week goes on with this. If I were a player on that team, and we're undefeated off of a big road win at Kansas, yeah. and we got our biggest conference game of the year, we're a conference opener of the year. Yeah, they got Boise later in the year. And we got a shot at maybe winning this league and making the playoff. And our, my starting quarterback bailed on me over yeah. potentially a promise for about next year. That that wouldn't yeah. that wouldn't sit well with me. But well, you know, these uh, captain at linebacker Jackson Woodyard tweeted out uh, to a picture of the of the new quarterback. About time, let's ride. So there we go. They're, they're they're all they're rallying around. It's Hill, right? The the backup quarterback's name is his last name is Hill, I believe. It's a kid. It's a kid who tra- It's a kid who transferred in from uh, from from Campbell. Okay. Okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully his check cleared. Um, and supposedly, uh, supposedly that supposedly they don't think uh, Sluka is that much better than him. So maybe maybe well, it's not going to be they, as much of a uh, a fall off as a lot of people think. But uh, I'm all in on UNLV. The rest, I'm rooting for, I'm rooting for the Rebels now. The rest of the year. Bear, well, one, 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 one team that you know I'm rooting for yeah. is the uh, is the helmet over my over my shoulder there, correctly, with September Heisman winner Cam Ward. We all know how the how the September Heisman winners go, <laughs> whether it's whether it's been uh, what what Forcier from, uh, from 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 Michigan or uh, Denard Robinson. Or Geno so, Smith, the long so just, list. So just of, Michigan uh, quarterbacks. What? Yeah. <laughs> the long list of September Heisman of, of illustrious September Heisman winners. Uh, he's gone on, but but Cam Ward is your Heisman favorite right now. It, it plus four fifty. Jackson Dart in there. Jalen Milrow, Nico, Dylan Gabriel. We'll have an interesting yeah. conversation in the uh, in the gambling group chat, which we recorded a little bit prior to uh, to this segment uh, about a potential way to bet the Georgia Alabama game. Uh, that involves Jalen Miller. So stay, stay tuned for that. 
is there still any value here left in, in the market? I mean, I think off of last week where he forced that fumble and he had a huge game receiving, uh, Travis Hunter, again, is gaining a lot of steam, and he's around 20 to 1 or so. He, he's on the field so many snaps per game. Uh, the, the question is, A, can he keep this level up of playing uh, th- this number of snaps per game? B, can he continue the level uh, that he's playing yeah. at? And C, and I guess this is the, the the biggest elephant in the room, is can Colorado win enough games for him to win the Heisman Trophy? Because I think whether there should be or there shouldn't be, uh, I think a lot of people are saying, I, I can't give a player on a 6-6 six and six sure. team the Heisman Trophy. So... Where, where do you stand on Hunter? I mean, we talked about him before the year. It it, it price is much bigger than what he is now. So I mean, I'm will I'm I made a good bet. I'm happy with those bets. I would expect him to win, but uh, but but here we are. So where do you stand on the whole Hunter? Is he the best player? Should he win? Type of yeah. deal. So, I think with unique players, you have unique circumstances, right, Bear? Like, he's a unique player. There's, there's nothing really ever like it. Now, there have been players that have d- gone both ways, but not at the level of Travis Hunter. And not only that, Bear, like, he's directly impacting games. He had the he mm-hmm. had the, fu- he had the tackle on the fumble, right? I mean, for, excuse me, forced the fumble that won them the game. Like, there are specific plays he is making that we can point to saying, these are the plays that are winning Colorado football games. And, yes, they might be six and six. That that you see, I mean, the Baylor win, I think maybe skewed sort of their win total, right? Like they mm-hmm. were certainly going under. They lost that game. Now they might go over. But to me, and I have a ticket as well as you do on Travis Hunter. This is where that cash out option sort of helps, right, Bear? Like mm-hmm. get to a certain point of the season. I think we both agree he's not going to win. He will be in New York City. Maybe that cash out option provides you a little bit of value at some point this year, Bear, right? To make a little bit of profit, because I think we both agree he's not going to win unless they go nine and three, which we, I don't think I don't think is happening. But maybe there's a cash out opportunity at some point to make a little bit of money on, on your Travis Hunter ticket. Yeah, then, then the next time I'm in the state of Arizona, I'll hop on the app where I made that bet. <laughs> what the cash the cash out option is. It's unfortunately in the state of Connecticut, I can't bet. Uh, Heisman awards or awards in, in general in, in college football, but yeah, I made, made that bet when I was at, out in LA for the uh, the summer of soccer there. I'd had a couple of off days and flew to flew to Phoenix in the morning. Went to the the, the Delta Sky Club for a couple of hours. Made a bunch of bets. Made a bunch bunch of cross board parlays involving uh, Euros and Copa and WNBA and NFL and. A whole bunch of stuff, and I made some some Heisman bets with Hunter. So yeah, if I happen to find myself in Arizona, I'll look and see what that that cash out option is. But if I had to make one bet right now, it would it would still be Quinn Ewers, and we talked about it a little bit uh, last week. I can't remember if it was here, if it was or with Bruce about how we kind of knew that Arch Manning would go out and have a great game against you all, Monroe. And that might have created a little bit more value on Quinn. You can still get Quinn at around 15 to 1 or so. Uh, I think he will play this weekend because I think if he doesn't play, you run the risk of uh, maybe giving the fan base kind of some ammunition to say, keep playing Arch, keep playing Arch. But Sark has been pretty steadfast at Quinn Ewers as quarterback, and uh, they have a national championship type team and a Heisman winning type quarterback in Quinn. So if I had to make one bet right now, uh, it would be Quinn Ewers because I do think if they happen to beat Georgia, get to the SEC title game, and they're undefeated, uh, he has a very, very good chance of winning. Uh, I I think he's playing the best or was playing the best till he got hurt. Uh, good offensive line, good, good wide receivers. Um, I, I I'm not I don't think wagering Dylan Gabriel Bear, but he's completing like 84 percent of passes. <laughs> like he, he's playing good. If they beat Ohio State. That number is coming way down. I'm not sure they're beating Ohio State. I'm just saying that um, if they do bear, is he's the front runner, right? Probably if he continues to play, you think the way so? He's playing now. Um, again, I, I don't know if he gets home. I don't know if he's dynamic enough to do that. But if they get by Ohio State. Uh, the schedule's pretty light on, on the back end. You get a Wisconsin team that uh, doesn't have a quarterback. That defense is, hasn't played terribly well. You have Michigan. That'll be tough. It's the games at Michigan that, that defense yep. can play well. But that's about it. Uh, I'm not saying you put money in Gabriel now, but I'm also saying that 
if they can beat Ohio State, and maybe that's how you play that game. You take you take Gabriel to win the Heisman. Um, he's playing good football right now. It's sort of ignored because Oregon kind of started a little bit slow there. You know, and that's and this is a great conversation and a great point to have because I I, I brought it up a couple of times last year. How I was sitting in South Bend the, the weekend of the USC Notre Dame game last year, and I got Jaden uh, Jaden Daniels at north of thirty to one. Yeah. And so th- these prices fluctuate ridiculously, and um, certainly it, it, you got to try and buy it, buy at the best possible price, and and sell at the best uh, right. possible price. So, uh, speaking of fluctuating, there is no fluctuating with the gambling group chat. Will Hill, Sammy P, join Jeff and I, kick around uh, all the biggest games in certain in, in some different ways. You can uh, attack betting them. Enjoy. Gambling group chat is back. Myself, Jeff, joined by Sammy P and Will Hill on a weekend in college football where we've got four ranked matchups, and obviously the biggest one takes place uh, Saturday night in Tuscaloosa, number two, Georgia at number four, uh, Alabama. What are we looking at here now? We've seen the the Bulldogs favored by anywhere between one and a half to two and a half. Uh, Scrolling down right now to get the most updated number from DraftKings. DraftKings looking at two. And 48 and a half. There are some one and a halfs out there if you like the dogs. Uh, Georgia getting a little bit of bad news with London Humphrey uh, being diagnosed with mono. So one of their better wide receivers is out uh, for this game. And this is a Georgia offense that struggled uh, in the, in the last time we saw them play on the road at Kentucky. Uh, a couple of weeks back, Carson Beck had some difficulties, but they did pull out a win. It kind of reminded me of that game at Missouri a couple of yeah. years ago where they had that fourth quarter comeback uh, and that ultimately rest of the year kind of unchallenged, wind up winning the uh, national championship. First time the Tide are a home dog since 2007, November 3rd. Uh, six and a half point dog. Uh, LSU wind up. Was that the overtime game? I'm trying to think. Was that, was that the game that it was at the Saban homecoming game? What? Where I went, no, no, wrong year, wrong year. Not wrong the, the nine to six game. No, no, two thousand two thousand nine six was the. Uh, I was there. Nine six was two thousand eleven. I was at that 2007, game. Two thousand seven was the weird, the, the the LSU crazy year where they had the comeback. Less eating the grass where he lost track of the time against Auburn. Yeah. Um, and, and then the the other comebacks that they have throughout the year. So I got I got my years uh, mistaken. A couple of years later was the. Uh, the, the the Nick return game to Baton Rouge where they uh w- w- was an overtime game I think they beat LSU in overtime I mean, John Parker Wilson might have got pushed in uh, in overtime the original push push so anyway I'm giving you a, an unofficial or an, un- an unofficial uh or oral history of uh Bama LSU and the uh, Nick Saban just returning to L- LSU uh, Alabama uh, era but on to on to Saturday night. It feels like a lot of times in these games, Sammy, that uh, when, when when Georgia goes on a road against the right team, typically the defenses uh, tend to have their way. Bam has been kind of kind of boom or bust uh, offensively. Really haven't been able to run the ball well, but they do got some big play wide receivers. Uh, I don't have a play in this game right now. Maybe I will by kickoff. But if you have made a made a play in this, or you you have any initial thoughts there, Sammy? Well, Bear, as we know, you don't always have to bet the biggest game on the board, but I can tell you what my numbers say. Uh, Georgia 131, Alabama 128 and a half. So two and a half points better on a neutral. How much is home field worth at Alabama? I think it's worth at least four. So Bama maybe should be a favorite in this game per my numbers. Want to be careful there. Don't want to say the wrong thing again with my numbers. (laughs) Um, A lot of people are talking about the over. The thing to consider in this game is that both teams have been off for a week. So that usually favors defense and preparation. Uh, We've seen this total come down a smidge, open 49. It's a little bit lower now. I don't know what's going to happen. And I feel totally okay saying that. Um, I would probably, if you made me bet it, like I have to do these picks every week. We're in a pool where we pick every top 25 game. I will probably put Alabama in there plus two. Don't feel great about it, though, Will. I mean, this is a game that could go any which way, side or total. Bet it, nerd. Bet it. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you, you hit on something too, where it's like both these teams are off a buy. So you've got DeBoer with time to prepare. You got Smart with time to prepare. That adds a lot of intrigue to me. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, and I'm not much of a betting split guy. I'm not a betting split guy at all, but I'll be interested to see what sort of the, uh, you know, the quote unquote public side is because how often do you get Bama at home getting points? But also, flip side of the coin, how often do you get Georgia under a field goal? I tend to lean towards the Georgia under a field goal. Now, uh, I know it's not the same team. They certainly miss Bowers. They miss McConkie. They don't have the same level of skill, same level of explosiveness. I've just seen too many warts with Bama. I don't know what to make of Bama yet. It feels like they are kind of caught in between the Saban era, not quite in the DeBoer era, the offensive line. I think the secondary, I watched a good part of that South Florida game. South Florida had guys open, wide open, all over the place. Uh, you can't take much against the Wisconsin game because Wisconsin was playing with a backup quarterback. I just think, and, and this is a little narrative-y, but Georgia probably comes into this game off a bad performance against Kentucky and off of last year with the idea that, hey, these guys ruined our chance at a three-peat. We could have repeated. We, th- we we maybe you know should have three-peated. And, and look, I, I probably wouldn't have bet against them to do so. So I don't want an angry Georgia team. I don't want to fade an, an angry Georgia team. I'll take Georgia on the money line. You know, like Sammy said, you don't have to bet the biggest game on the board. But I do think Georgia has enough to uh, to sneak by. But, man, what a, what a game. Saturday night, Tuscaloosa. This will be a, a fun one to watch for sure, Bear. I don't have anything on this game, but I do think that the wild card is the Alabama team, as well mentioned. Like, we know what we're getting from Georgia, right? I, th- I think we pretty much know what we're getting from them. They have some injuries, though, that are concerned, right? Some offensive line injuries, some defense line injuries. Though Those will matter in this game. But Kalen DeBoer, look, maybe I'm scarred from last season, the year before that. Like, he coaches well in big games. Just always has. He gets two weeks to prepare. Like, they'll have something for Georgia. It comes down to how Milro plays, right? Is he dynamic with his arm? We know he can run, but can he throw the ball? If Georgia says, hey, we're not going to let you run the football, can you throw the ball? And then defensively, as you guys have mentioned, Alabama has had warts. They have not played an offense remotely close to what they're going to see this weekend. They've given up chunk plays. They've given up running. Like So, to me, it's it's it's, it's, it's Alabama as the wild card, right? Like, I just think if they, if they play, if they've improved, I should say, during the bye – this so could be Alabama's game. If they just sort of are what they are, what we've seen a lot the first three weeks, I, I think Georgia wins this game. But I would not bet against Kalen DeBoer in a big game like this. Bear, you also follow- you got to consider this too, Bear, the Heisman market. Because Cam Ward, as much as I love the U this year, mm-hmm. they really haven't played anybody. And that win against Florida maybe isn't as strong as it looked at the right. time. But this is the first real Heisman moment for guys like Jalen Milrow and Carson Beck. And you can get Milrow, DraftKings has him about 8-1 to one right now. If he goes off in this game, 8-1 to one is long gone. Conversely, Carson Beck, you could find it 16-1 to one to win the Heisman. If he goes off, that number goes way down. So maybe, maybe a better bet, rather than get involved with the side, is bet the quarterback of the team you like to win the Heisman. And if that comes to fruition... Forget your plus two, minus two. You're talking about a Heisman number that could maybe be chopped in half on either side, depending on who wins. Yeah, I like I like betting it that way better than just betting the game because I think we've all kind of proven the the point that I made earlier. Like I don't know what to do with this game. And Sammy, you said it. Like I don't know what to do with this game, and and I'm okay saying it. Like, but 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 you're right. The one thing, Jeff, I do want to ask you is, do you think there might be a slight advantage for Georgia here only because Nick Saban, all these coaches in the SEC were so familiar with him and, and they knew, they know Georgia, they know what they're going to do. They know their tendencies and know how Kirby's going to adjust for certain things. The fact that DeBoer hasn't played him yet and hasn't been uh, in, in, in the foxhole in battle with him, maybe he's not as anticipatory of what Kirby's going to do. Do you think that might have, a little bit of an edge for for Kirby and Georgia here, or do you think that's kind of just a a, a non factor? I, I think it certainly was an edge uh, in the past, um, but he did play Oregon's defense, which is so supposed to be Georgia esque in scheme, right, Bear? I mean, they don't have the players that Georgia had, obviously, and he tore those defenses up. So, I mean, I, I think he sort of understands what Georgia wants to do now. That of course. They had better players, right? So they're able to execute better than Oregon was the last couple of seasons. I, I don't think it's that big of a problem. Look, again, Kim DeBoer is what now? 111 and 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 14 as a head coach? I mean, like, all he does is win games. And I think if you give him two weeks to prepare, he'll, he'll be fine and, and be able to make adjustments. Remember now, Bear, and everyone, 
those they get video on the sidelines now. Like these coaches can make adjustments better than ever before. The ones who know how to use it correctly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing. Too, I was just going to say quickly. Uh, uh, sorry, I was just going to jump in and, and talk about the Heisman because you're talking about Milrow. Uh, ha- has a 17 year old ever been considered for the Heisman? This kid Williams, the receiver for Bama. Oh my goodness! I don't know if it's going to be this year, but he's going to be on some Heisman watch lists pretty soon. And if they win, if Bama wins this game, uh, he's probably going to have a monster game. And if you're looking for like, hey, think outside the box and not just the quarterback. If this kid has you know 200 yards and a couple touchdowns, who knows? We've seen wide receivers from Bama win before. Yeah, no, but between between he and, and Jeremiah Smith, you got a couple of like really young, un- unbelievable wide receivers. You, you just think the, the last time Bama was a home dog was the, was the year that this kid was born. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just amazing. Kids born in, in, in 2007. So it, it's interesting, though, this game and, and who it matters. You know, I, I love the who does it matter more to? It matters to both teams because they both want to win. But if you look at Georgia's schedule, like they got to go – on the road to Bama, who's ranked fourth, Texas, who's ranked first number right now, and at Ole Miss, who's sixth. And then they have Tennessee, who's number five at home. They got four of the top six on their schedule, which is pretty remarkable. And look, you wouldn't expect Georgia to lose all of them. You would think they'll they'll win at least one, uh, maybe two. But I, I guess I, I'll, I'll take whoever wants to take it. Like if Georgia finishes nine and three against this schedule. Like, like, how do we view them? Do we, I mean, they're a, still a big price, the yes, to make it into the, the college football playoff. But is there a, a scenario where a 9-3 and three Georgia might not be uh, in, in the top 12 at the end of the year? I think we would all agree talent-wise they probably would be. But do we really have an idea what the committee might do with the 9-3 and three Georgia? Could they uh, un, un, unbelievably uh, be left out? I would say we probably, having never had a 12-team playoff, I think none of us are really aware of how weak the end of the bubble, like the back end of these playoff teams is going to be. I still think 9-3, and three, Georgia, the branding, who their losses would be against. I still think, if you force me to answer, 9-3, and three, Georgia would probably get in, Sammy. The top six teams in the country right now, in terms of power rating, five of them are from the SEC. <laughs> Georgia, Texas, Old Miss, Alabama, Tennessee. So it sort of depends on how they get to nine and three. If they get to nine and three and lose three games by a combined 10 points, they're in. But if they get worse over the course of the season, you could make a case. But if you're the committee, you probably want to put the perennial contender into the playoff over a team like Notre Dame. Let, let's play this forward. Do we put in a 9-3 and three Georgia Oof. with losses to Bama, Ole Miss, and Tennessee, or do we put in an 11-1 and one Notre Dame with a loss to Northern Illinois? To me, it, yeah. it's an easy, easy answer, That's Jeff. Right. It's well, the SEC it, team. Yeah. Well, I, I'll take a step further. A, a 10-2 and two Iowa team or a 9-3 and three Georgia team? I think you're taking Georgia, oh, right? Because look, we, we learned last year, obviously, that Georgia probably should have been included and would have been competitive in a four-team playoff, even with the loss in the, the season. I don't. I don't think they'll make that mistake twice. I mean, that, that's the point of the twelve-team playoff, right? Is to not make that mistake. Is to get the twelve best teams in, regardless of record. Now, of course, record matters. You can't be eight and four. But if you're nine and three, having played that schedule, to Sammy's point, it's how you lose those games, right? If you lose by three, three times, you're in over another team. If you get blown out on two of them. You're probably not in, right? So it depends on how you lose, and then also the other teams around. I, th- I think we feel comfortable with Ohio State, right, and and Penn State, and probably still, you know, one ACC team, Miami, maybe Clemson uh, gets in there as well. The way they're playing right now, one Big Twelve team, one G five team, yeah, a nine and three Georgia would slot in there between ten and twelve, and they still might be the fourth best team in the country, even though they're nine and three. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Like, I, I, I would totally agree with you. On, on Georgia potentially being in. Uh, you mentioned Ohio State. You mentioned Penn State, the other team in, in, in the Big Ten who we feel pretty good about in making the playoff. We remember that last uh, the last time uh, Illinois headed to State College, that unbelievably horrendous nine overtime game where just it was they were just trading two point conversions. It, it, it was just an absolutely painful watch. And uh, Illinois co- coming up like you got an upset win over Kansas. You got an upset win at Nebraska. Now you're a 
an 18 point dog on the road at Penn State, who has looked pretty good for the most part this year, outside of uh, a spell on that Bowling Green game where, where BG uh, had, had had the lead for a good point. But they came out and they took care of a, a terrible Kent State team and they took care of West Virginia very handily uh, in Morgantown. Uh, I remember, remember that note that we I, I brought up during prior to that West Virginia game about how uh, James Franklin in the when favored between seven and twenty four points. Now, I, I think it's now seventeen zero and one against the number. Yeah. But like this, this falls into that category, and, and it looks like Sammy. It looks like Illinois uh, is a very popular underdog, and I, and I can't blame anybody uh, for 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 taking eighteen in this game if that's the way they. They view it. I made the game 24 to 13. So I would lean to an Illinois cover, but I also am nervous that this is the game that Illinois falls behind and mm-hmm. doesn't have the ammo. What I think I'm going to do, guys, is 24 like this 13, total. by the way. You said you had seen that was your score. It yeah. was 48 in this game. I it's like the under. That's that's what I was getting at. I, I, I think it's more likely we get a 31 10 game. Penn State wins by 21, then we get a, a 38 to 24 game because Illinois is very good at a couple things. Number one, they're 131st in pace right now, guys. 131st. So they are playing Bert. so slow, so slow. This is Burt Ball. Run the ball, you know, jam it up the guard, you know, keep the ball Ooh. and keep Penn State. Off the field. I know that. Did it move, Jeff? When I say jam it up the yeah, guard, yeah, a little oh, bit. Yeah, was, you love yeah, that. I, yeah, it was great. Yeah, you they don't have. They don't have. <laughs> they don't have the guys to be in a shootout. So I have to imagine Bielema is going to try and eat clock, run the football, punt the ball probably a million times, and make Drew Aller prove that he can go eighty yards, eighty-five yards on your defense. Could Penn State cover? Of course. I had a tweet the other day. Should I put the 401k on Illinois? No. Oh. No. You should not. You should not do that, actually. I lean under this open 47. It's up to 48 at DraftKings. I don't know how much higher it's going to go. I would love 49 to go under 49. But again, 24-13, that's where I'm at. So I am substantially, well, lower than the total by 10 points. I think we have a little crossfire. We might need to do a little uh, side bet. I actually look towards the over just Ooh. because I look at Colt and Nikki and, you know, he's going to figure out a way to put up 30 something points. I thought Nebraska really, you know, threw it well, probably should have thrown it more last week. Um, look, I, you make a good point about the Illinois pace, but uh, Bowling Green moved the ball against his Penn State defense. And if Penn State's in the 30s, what do we need out of Illinois? Like 17? I don't know. I could just see like a, I don't know, 35, 17 type of game that would put it as a push towards the total. I do lean towards taking the points. Of course, I, I haven't bet yet. I'm terrified of the scenario where, you know, Penn State gets the ball up 14 and and, Hart, and uh, Franklin is on a mission to, uh, you know, it's like he's driving to win the Super Bowl <laughs> yeah. to cover that number at 18. So I don't want any part of that. It'd be lean towards Illinois, but I actually like the over more than the under here. Will, I think you said it, what's going to happen, right? It's 24-10. Has, has the ball with six, with six minutes left. Oh, he's like Mahomes and, in the and, Super Bowl. He's yeah. got to get right in. Absolutely. And as they always do, they're going to score with a minute and a half left to go up 31-10 and cover this game. Sam is going to hit his under, and Penn State's going to cover. Th- that's my concern. Right? I, mean, I think Illinois sort of has to win one way. They beat a Nebraska team that is more flawed than I think we we think. Yeah. You know, Rill is a fun story. It's a great story. But that offense actually doesn't really produce very much. And Nebraska, they, they scored 28 points against Colorado early. That, that was about it. That game was dominated by, by that defensive line. So I think Illinois beat a Nebraska team that isn't as good as we think. This is a much tougher task. They're on the road for the second straight week. And I think they just have one way to win. And when you have one way to win on the road, that, that concerns me about your ability to to cover. It's a big number. I'm not, I'm not wedging on this game. But I actually would lean to Penn State a tiny bit here covering this game late. Yeah, yeah I, I have a feeling I'll have probably have a Penn State ticket in my uh... – in my pocket, especially if this thing maybe uh, dips to 17 and a half or so, that might be a little bit more in- enticing as well. But I, I-, I would lean Penn State as well. Um, question for the room: Did did we by and by we, uh, meaning the the collective college football community, do we kick uh, kick dirt on all Dabo and Clemson maybe a little bit too soon? I mean, since that loss to to Georgia 
125 points in two games. Uh, Club Knicks accounted for 11 touchdowns. And, and and Clemson fans have basically been been asking, where the hell's this offense been the, the last couple of years? They look at the schedule, and the only current ranked team they have remaining on the schedule is Louisville. I mean, and there's a chance, I think, by the time they play Louisville, uh, if Louisville were to lose to Notre Dame, lose to Miami, like Louisville may be unranked. So, like, they're, they're, we're, we're looking at a chance, uh, an opportunity here, I think, with, with, with Clemson. Maybe so much hype around Miami. Uh, it looks like they maybe, is there a little bit of value still on Clemson maybe to win uh, the ACC, despite our love for the Canes there, Jeff? I don't think so. I think we know what Clemson is by now, right? They're, they're good against the teams that they should beat, right? Then when they run up against a team like Miami, or Georgia, they're not good enough to beat that team, right? Like, like, like this weekend, they play Stanford. I think the number is about 21, 21 and a half. I haven't checked the last couple of days. I'm waiting for it to come down to to, to Clemson. Like, they're going to dominate Stanford. Stanford's on the road again. I, I don't know if they stand on the East Coast, but that's a long – Syracuse, back to Stanford, back to Clemson. It's going to be warm this weekend in South Carolina. Like, a, a little wet conditions as well. Like, I, I think they play ball at Stanford. Like, they, they – guys, they – They've always done this, right? They play well against the teams they should, and then when they play the teams that that are 50-50 games, they lose those games. So this is what I expected. I thought they'd win 9 or 10 games, lose to Georgia. They might drop one here and there, but Miami, to me, is a more dynamic team. And then, of course, in a one-game situation, Will, they can lose that game. But this is what I thought Clemson is. The expectations for Clemson are to beat Georgia, right, or to win those big games. It's not to beat Stanford. We, we, We know they can do that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we kick dirt on them too fast in terms of like, hey, this team could actually still win a national championship. I don't know if they're on, we're on that level, but I think we did probably, at least I did, kick dirt on them. We're like, hey, oh, they're going to go under 9.5. They're not even a factor in the ACC anymore. And, you know, Bear pointed out, they're going to be favored. They should probably win the rest of their games in this ACC that we thought, I, I thought, was a little more balanced, a little deeper than it was in the past. I mean, you just look at it. SMU, NC State, VaTech, Florida State. Uh, a lot of these teams have not even been disappointing. Just very, very uh, underwhelming here. And yeah, not to sit here and just uh, you know give out a million guys for Heisman, but I think there's some 75, 80 to one on Klubnik. If you're getting, you're talking like you know free bets or some of these boosts. If you're just looking mm-hmm. for long shots that you think are live going into the ceremony, I mean, if they run the table, that number is not going to be 75 to one. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Clemson is, is probably a little better than I thought three weeks ago. Will is cornering the Heisman market like our guy GRP right now. He's just got every player <laughs> in the country to win the Heisman. Uh. Let me, let me spin this forward a week. If Clemson wins this game by 35, I'm not I'm not saying that's going to happen. Let's just play this out. I'm not going to bet the side. If Clemson wins this game by 35 or more, can I get four and a half with Florida State at home next week? That's what I want to know. Because right now you've got a Florida State team that nobody wants to bet, and I understand it. But how much better is Clemson than Florida State on a neutral? I think it's probably like a touchdown. Yes. So, okay, how much is home field worth at Florida State? Four and a half, five. Ooh, I don't know about that right now, brother. Okay, three and a half. So so Clemson minus three and a half at Florida State. Are you laying that number, Bear? Yes. Oh, you are? Okay. Yes. Okay. I don't think the market has appreciated how bad Florida State is. Okay. I, they I, played the Cal Bears I, close. I the, fighting, the fighting Justin Wilcox has covered that spread, though. Like, no, they, no, they didn't cover the under hit, right? But they didn't cover that game. Yeah, it was 14 two, two and, and a half. They, they had every chance to cover and win the game outright. <laughs> they just, they just couldn't. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that's a bad Florida State offense, man. Maybe this will be a fun discussion to have uh, le- leading up to that game. But yeah, maybe I think maybe maybe my opinion of Florida State is a little more negative than others. But yeah, it just does not look like a team that. Uh, is going to beat anybody of consequence or, or play in, with a really good team this year. But that's just my opinion. You talk, you, so you, you mentioned Florida State next week as an ugly dog. Can I interest anybody in my uh, my trio? It, it, it's like going to uh, Olive Garden to get in like the tour of Italy or whatever the heck they used to call it. Like, can, can, can I interest anybody when, in Maryland plus seven against Indiana, Ooh. Purdue plus 10 against Nebraska, and Minnesota plus nine versus Michigan? A- a- anybody want a piece of, the, of that stench? I, I think Indiana is really good. I, I like they they have played some good football so far. I don't know if I'm laying the seven with them in this game. I, I'm going to look more on it. Um, 
Purdue guys, I watched that Oregon State game on the CW. I don't know how many, how many people <laughs> managed to catch that one. I saw the ratings, not a lot. A lot Purdue, of people probably Purdue, did, Jeff, because there was a that that they were betting Purdue last week like they knew insane. the final score. Yeah. I, I again the, the the COB there. I took Oregon State as soon as it got under three. I thought that was a little crazy. The Beavers are not overly talented. They dominated. Like Purdue is bad. Now, this is Rayola's first road game, which could matter in this. I, th- I think we're seeing sort of first time quarterbacks on the road struggle, but it's Purdue. It's, it's, not, it's not at Ohio State. Uh, so I, I would actually lean towards towards Nebraska in that one and and lean toward Indiana Will. Uh, I don't have really much on Michigan. I can't look. I, I I I've reached a point where I, I don't think I can wager on teams that can't throw the football. Yeah. <laughs> like I like I mean you, you just and we'll get to Oklahoma State and Kansas State in a second. But if you can't throw the football, I can't wager on you, Will. Like Michigan to me is a complete stay away at all times. I, I love how Sam and I joked about this. We were on Michigan the previous two weeks. We knew it was the right side this week. We knew it was. We didn't do it. And Michigan obviously beat USC and covered. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah, my only problem with Minnesota, they have struggled against these run first teams. I mean, Iowa didn't really put the ball in the air last week, and Iowa dominated that game, you know, in Minnesota. So that that's the only concern. Again, I, I just I can't lay nine with a team that can't throw it, but I'd actually probably lay it before I took it in that one. Um, I, I don't know if you have anything on those, Sammy. Those none of those made my card though. How's Minnesota gonna score? Yeah. That's my only concern. It's not that I love laying nine with Michigan. I mean, I wouldn't, to Jeff's point, I wouldn't take six last week at home. I'm not going to lay nine, <laughs> nine and a half. I just, I don't know. I mean, they looked better with Orgy. And finally, Sharon Moore realized, I'm going to take Davis Warren, and I'm going to send him back to boarding school where he belongs and get him <laughs> off of my field. What a joke that was. I want to know this, Bear. How much better was Davis Warren at camp than Alex Orgy? And how did it take this long to figure out that Alex Orgy was your better quarterback? Like three interceptions against Texas, three interceptions against Arkansas State, and finally Sharon Moore is like sitting there at 2 in the morning eating cheese dip thinking, you know, I'm going to go to Alex Orgy. Like how did he mess that up so bad in the offseason? I'm just just going to decide. I can explain. I, I can explain. Times game. Here's what I think happens, right, Sammy? You're in training camp. A guy like Warren does better as a passer in camp, right? He sees the same defense every day. He's doing well in practice. He does well against the scout team. You get to game day, and he plays he's just not a game day player. And you have to wait a couple of weeks to sort of see that happen. You, 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 if you make a decision who your quarterback is, you shouldn't change after a week or two. That's, I think, what happened is he was good in practice. He was Good in, in in against scout team during the week, and then in the game he just stunk. And eventually it was like we can't go back to this guy because look, Alex Orgy. The problem is he can't throw the ball. I thought they would do something interesting in the pass game, just anything against USC. Nothing. Their offense was three explosive runs. That was it. So I think that's why they went with Warren early and then realized he wasn't good enough and just said screw it. We'll take the more athletic quarterback that could do some you know good things for us with his legs. And we'll just try to hit home runs if we can. If not, we'll just beat up someone with the line of scrimmage. Total's yeah. gotten absolutely pounded too. Open forty in the desert, thirty-five and a half Ooh. at DraftKings right now. <laughs> that nine nine point favorite total of thirty-five. Still don't know about uh, Loveland either. So that could be another uh, Michigan offensive weapon that would miss his potentially second straight game. I don't know. I think the Gophers are going to find my way onto the ticket. It's it just such a Coming off of that upset win last week in which they kind of SC really helped them out by just with that game plan. You can't tackle pick six. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I, a lot has to go right, I think, for Michigan to win by double digits. But we, we'll, we'll see. I was totally wrong in, in well, a shocker. Uh, I'm wrong a lot. But last week, I actually played Louisville in the look ahead against Notre Dame at plus three and a half. Because I thought Louisville was going to go out and crush Georgia Tech, uh, which they really didn't. And I thought we would see this number close uh, quite. Yeah, it was actually four and a half. And so I took Louisville plus four and a half last week uh, in one of the lookouts. I thought it was going to close under a field goal. And now we see Notre Dame minus six in a lot of spots. Like, look, I know they went to Purdue and in, in won 65 7 or whatever the heck it was, but Louisville is a hell of a lot better than Purdue. I, you you want to lay a touchdown with, with, with Notre Dame here, Will? No, uh, I wouldn't bet. Like, it's six and a half right now. I'm looking at DraftKings. 
there's no point in recording this middle of the week. No point taking six and a half middle of the week because you might get a seven. And if yep. you get a seven, that's a big deal. And if it goes to six, all right, it's not as big a deal as if it goes to seven. But I'm completely with you. The Louisville front four is really good. They're really good against the run. It's still a Notre Dame team. Hey, can they make big plays? Uh, offensively through the passing game with that offensive line, with their you know quarterback receiver situation, that I'm not sure. And Brom has always been really good as an underdog. Now, look, Notre Dame lost to them last year. There's some revenge, you know. But I think both teams are going to look at this game and hey, hey, we have to run the ball to be successful. I think Brom and Louisville are probably going to run it to, to shorten the game because uh, Notre Dame has its flaws, but it's secondary. Its pass defense is not one of them. They're really good against the pass. So to me, as as I'm talking here more, it's it's maybe more of an underplay, but I, it would certainly be Louisville for me. I, Hoping to get a seven, but at six and a half, if I had to bet at six and a half, uh, I would take it. I, I do like Louisville on the spot. I think you could take the advantage and look at a Louisville money line that has ballooned from plus 140 maybe a week or two ago. You know, if the number is three, three and a half, we're talking about a favorite of about minus 190, give or take. So you got a dog price of, well, depending on the book and the splits, 150 or so. How about two to one on the Louisville money line? I mean, you can get 195 right now. Notre Dame, to me, is the toughest team in the country to peg this year because they have showed you their A game and they have showed you their F game. And the truth always sort of lies in the middle. And the middle, to me, is a game that's probably going to be tied in the fourth quarter. At which point, if you're holding plus 195, $2 on Louisville, you're probably not in the worst spot. Um I just, I don't like the quarterback room at Notre Dame. I think Riley Leonard's a bum. And it's too bad because he was really good at Duke and then just had so many injuries with the ankle and then the toe. And he just, he never really became the player that he was supposed to be. When he was a sophomore, he was, remember that run? Was it against Clemson last year when he like ran over the linebacker and ran for 70 yards and they went nuts? That's not the same guy anymore because his body has has just not held up. I don't think Louisville plus 195, two to one is the worst idea. Remember I said earlier that I, I don't like laying the points, a lot of points with bad quarterbacks. I mean, Riley Leonard, guys, I know he's a little beat up right now. He's averaging five adjusted air yards per pass attempt. Five. Is that good? He has one touchdown this season. One touchdown this season passing. I just don't trust him as a quarterback with the offensive line they have in Notre Dame right now. And and they're very reliant in the run game, obviously. Louisville knows this. They can say, hey, man, we're going to shut that down, find other ways to beat us. So I, I would lean toward Louisville here. I don't have much on this game quite yet. But the Sammy's point, Notre Dame is a team that I don't think you could wager on right now um, at, at all until either Leonard becomes more consistent um, or they find sort of more of a, a more consistent offense. Yeah, I'll, being that I – Said last week I took Louisville plus four and a half. I'll probably take some of uh, Sammy's advice there and just play a little outright uh, Louisville money line play as well. Uh, It's kind of a big week in in the Big 12 this week. Uh, If you're you're looking for like the depth, quality of depth of games, uh, I I think the Big 12 is probably your spot. Uh, You've got Colorado UCF. That's going to be the big noon game. Uh, Big noon kick. The big new kickoff show game, I should say. Uh, the game on Fox at noon is Minnesota at Michigan. But uh, Colorado UCF will be at 3.30 uh, on Fox as well with uh, Jason Bedetti and Joel Klatt and Allison Williams uh, on the call. Number is big there. You've, you've also got Arizona, Utah. you had Oklahoma State, Kansas State, two teams coming off of uh, kind of embarrassing losses last week. Yeah, speaking of embarrassing losses, Baylor is back home, favorite against BYU. Ah, ah, yeah. Don't say oh, Baylor. Yeah. Don't say it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 that should have been. That's a. That's a. That's a. Straight, and you, and you red, mentioned Oklahoma State. Straight oh. red. Straight red card on me for not giving you a trigger warning on both Oklahoma State and Baylor. There, that was uh, literally walked right in the door last night, uh, home from. Uh, I see. This is the type of year where I forget where we were last week already. Ohio we're, State, I think. Yeah, I was at Ohio State. Yeah, so literally walked in uh, just in time to see Baylor snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, and uh, it was not. It was not a good way to uh, to walk in the door uh, doing that. So, you know, I got a ton of games here in the Big Twelve. I, I guess we'll just start it off with the with, with the game that the Big Noon Show is going to be at. Uh, Colorado UCF, UCF up to like 15, 15 and a half or so. Uh, 
I don't know. It fe- it feels kind of big, but at the same time, UCF coming off of an idle week. Harvey can run the ball. Jefferson. I mean, this is this is a team that I thought was a, a contender in the Big Twelve before the year. I still think there's value on them. Uh, th- this game is the is the Super Six sponsored by DraftKings game. Uh, we've got the the column coming out later in the week, and one of the games is going to be uh, what will the outcome of the of, of this game be? UCF uh, minus fifteen and a half, or uh, Colorado to to cover that fifteen and a half. So. I, I guess, Sammy, I'll, I'll start with you. I know uh, Colorado's near and dear to your heart after last week, so I just I just want you to let it all out right there. Uh, you you going to come back with the Buffs this week or no? I stared at the ceiling <laughs> for 15 minutes after that Hail Mary. Oh, it hurt. I, I had a lot of money on Baylor, plus two, money line, second half, plus three, that was one of those Niagara Falls second halves where you knew they were all going to come Colorado minus three. They're down seven at half. Oh, all they got to do is not lose by four. Right? Yep. They, I mean, just a, a double down chase a la carte. Here you go. Colorado minus three second half. Have at it, Haas. And everything is winning with two seconds, two, two seconds to go. Ball at midfield. The field goal, I mean, nobody talks about the fact that Baylor missed the field goal to go up 10 Mm -hmm. with two minutes to go. Everything that went wrong went wrong. I'm just staring at the ceiling wondering, why, Lord? Why me? And then you got (laughs) Jeff breaking down the game. Like, Jeff's breaking down the film the next day, and they show the guy that was supposed to contain uh, contain Sanders. He runs right into the line. Like, he had one job. All you got to do is spy the quarterback, run outside, and put your hands up. He ran right into the line, which allowed Shadur to rip it. Great throw. I hated the call. Just like 90. Shut up! No. Ah! That was the worst. That was the worst result. What were we talking about? Oh, Colorado UCF. Um, Here's the thing about UCF. Their pass defense is problematic. They are not good against the pass. So... I don't like Colorado, obviously, for for many reasons at this point. Colorado can score in this game. Total went from 63 to 64 and a half, 65. We're going to get some points. I I haven't bet it yet. I would take over 14, probably, with Colorado. This feels very backdoor coverage for Colorado. Um, I'm going to talk about this game a little bit later for one of my wagers this weekend. But Colorado, guys, is a pretty good second-half team. They don't allow a lot of points. They score a ton of points second-half of games because Sanders is sort of scrambling, trying to find Hunter Dowfield. I mean, I, I think this is a game where you you don't feel comfortable if UCF is up 21 with seven minutes left because Colorado can score at any time, any different way. I will say, though, uh, UCF, guys, I'm looking up right now, th- their pass rush uh, is ranked 22nd in the country by PFF. That's a problem for Colorado. Like, there's a lot of things that, that can go wrong here for Colorado, but I think their offense and how they operate in the second half of games um, will keep this game closer than we think at the end. Uh, UCF will start fast, but Colorado will be able to do enough, I think, to cover uh, by uh, by the end of this game. I don't think Colorado is in any way wins this game, but I would take Colorado full game before I do anything else. Yeah, the question in this game for me is the Colorado run defense. It's better. Is it better enough? Um, good, good enough here to hang. I'm skeptical of that. When you look at UCF, man, up tempo, uh, over six yards of carry. I mean, they're putting up video game numbers with what they do on the ground. Uh, UCF team total 40 and a half. I like the over. I just think, uh, they'll keep scoring. I think they'll have to keep scoring. They play so fast to me, then getting to, you know, 42, 45, 49 points is, is certainly within the realm of possibility in terms of the spread, taking or lay it, it'd be Colorado or nothing because I do think they can, you know, get enough points to, to hang around in the back door will be open. But I think I like the central Florida team total over the most of anything here, bear. Yeah. Would something like 49, 35 be, be surprising here? Probably not. So no, I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, if, I, I think if everything we've discussed here, I think your, your view on UCF team total over is the way, is the way that I would probably play it the the most confidently here so that, that's game number one in the big 12 game number two and utah just continues to kind of smoke and mirror their way to to wins uh sammy we you were all over we were all over it last week about the the 
be careful with the rising injury. And sure enough, he did not play. And somehow Alan Bowman was probably the worst quarterback on the field. And that includes Cam Rising, who was unable to, to throw the football. Utah getting the road win uh, in in Stillwater. And they're still the favorite to win the, win the Big 12. I don't know, though. And now they're laying double digits against uh, an Arizona team that can't stop the run, uh, but but they have some threats in the passing game as well. Uh, I've got no real opinion on this game, uh, given again we don't, we don't know what Utah's going to do with the quarterback position, and you would assume that Utah will just be able to run the ball up and down the field. So now, I got nothing on this one. Do you have any any thoughts here? All I know is that the Utah reporters are going to embellish the truth every week. <laughs> how did the guy? How about the guy on the sideline? who was not only tweeting that Cam was going to start, but that Cam looks good in warm-ups and Cam is spinning the ball deep. Shut up, dude. Like, what? Like, there's one thing to report what a coach tells you to say. And clearly, Whittingham told them all to say, hey, Cam's good to go. Mm-hmm. But this guy embellished the truth, Bear. A beat writer basically saying that Cam looks good. Cam's got no issue gripping the ball. Cam this, stop. Cam that. And then he doesn't play. Like, to me, that's... That's journalistic integrity 101. Tell the truth. It's one thing to say that he's good enough to play, but this guy was saying, oh, he looks great. He's throwing balls deep. Lies. All lies. All of them. I was getting flamed on the phone. Did you see what this guy was tweeting? Yeah, I did see it. Watch him not play still because Utah, Utah's like, they just try and confuse you and they just tell you things that aren't true about their quarterback for what feels like eight years now with Cam Rising. Um, I don't know, guys. It's a pass. I I don't want to lay 11 with Utah. Arizona's got a really good quarterback, a good wide receiver in McMillan, who probably goes off the board first at wide receiver. I have no edge in the game, so it's a pass. Yeah, speaking of uh, journalistic integrity, we had newsbreakers tweeting out, you know, hours before the game, breaking news: he may play or he may not. Basically, was the uh, was the scoop. Was like, Thanks. I mean, it was just it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we should change the name of this this podcast to "Who's Playing Quarterback for Utah?" Because I think going back to our first ever podcast last summer, it was Cam Rising questionable against Florida in that opening game, and that's last August. And of course, he's questionable for that game. He doesn't play a snap the entire year. So yeah, it's crazy. And uh, as far as this game, I I can't lay eleven where I don't know who's playing quarterback. Utah does have the revenge from that beatdown Arizona put on them last year. Arizona is coming off a bye. Well, if you've watched Arizona, they certainly need the bye because they have not looked good defending the run. Uh, Kansas State ran it all over them. It's Fafita, it's McMillan, and it's not much else on offense. Uh, so, look, I just I would take it before I would lay it, but, Bear, this is not anything I have in the account right now. Yeah, I, I, after Utah burned us last week, guys, I'm, I'm out right now in Utah. I need a little bit of a break. Uh, we had that story, I think, uh, we talked about it Wednesday when we recorded. We we basically had it Monday, guys, right? We, we were betting Oklahoma State fairly early in the week, um, and that did not go our, our way. I, I think Rising will play. I, I, I haven't even bothered to ask. Like I just, I just defeated this week. I don't uh, even after, care after anymore. Weekend. I don't even yeah, care if he plays is. anymore. I don't that's care. What it is. I just, it's apathy. Like I, I can reach out. I could probably find out. I, I just don't care. Um, Arizona, as as you guys have mentioned, they can't stop the run. They lost a lot of personnel. They lost their coach from last season. They're they're what Colorado basically is, right? They're a quarterback and wide receiver. Quarterback in, in some games they're going to look really great. In other games they're not. I think we know what Utah is. They're going to run the football. Their defense played better than I thought against Oklahoma State. They didn't look as good against Utah State. I, I think you, you just sit home and watch this game. Uh, there's not much money to put in this. May, maybe if uh, second half under at some point, if Utah gets out to a big lead and tries to eat the clock up at the last, you know, the last couple of minutes of this game. But that's about all I got for this one. Yeah, I want to lay five with Kansas State, but but I worry it, it looks a little too. I mean, they 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 just got snowballed last week at BYU in kind of an obvious spot uh, coming off of that win the week before. You go on the road, you're a big favorite, and now and, and then BYU is looking to maintain home field there in in the role of an underdog, and, and, and BYU did get the outright win. It feels like Kansas State is the right side here against an Oklahoma State team that looked just looked bad last week. And uh, Alan Bowman, year seven or whatever it is as well, 
he should not be making some of the throws and some of the decisions that he's been making uh, right now. It, it feels like a climbing type game where they do they just kind of kind of bowl over Oklahoma State here and get back to be, be physical and, and kind of take that loss personally. I think here Kansas State, I think minus five could be something that finds its way into my account, even though no knowing Gundy, this will be the week when everybody counts him out that 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 he winds up pulling an upset. I, I Bear, I don't think they're going to pull upset because they're not good at key positions. They're not good at quarterback and not good at offensive line. All I heard this offseason was their offensive line was older, 23 and a half. And, and I, I sort of tweeted about this. We talked about this a little bit as we previewed the Big 12. That's a red flag to me. Like, if your offensive line is that old, that means those guys aren't good enough to play in the NFL. That means they're just dudes, right? They're just jags on your team. Like, And we see right now, they can't run the football. You can't do anything offensively. Now you're on the road after playing a tough physical game. The, the Kansas State final score last weekend was not indicative of how that game went. It was 6-3, to three, and then in, in about five minutes, yep. BYU scored 30 points. And, like, that was the game. It's over because you know, Avery Johnson can't throw, right? So we know they're not going to come back in games. But if they start with an early league at Oklahoma State, they're just going to run the ball down their throats, just like Utah did. So I think Kansas State will, to your point, Bear, it might make its way into a wager of mine this weekend. We kind of want to see where that number goes between now and uh, and Saturday. Uh, but, Will, I'm I'm on Kansas State here. Or, Sammy, go ahead. I thought Mike Gundy made multiple mistakes in that game last week, namely the first drive of the game. They go straight down the field. And remember, Bear, you got a team in Utah that's about to start a freshman quarterback on the road in a hostile environment for the first time. And what did Mike Gundy do? He kicked a 23-yard field goal <laughs> to go up 3 nothing, And I thought to myself, what? what What happened to Mike Gundy? That is, you have to go for that there and make it 7 nothing and get the crowd into it and put this kid in a situation that is more pressurized. Right. Exactly. Also, worst, worst comes to worst, you know, you don't get the touchdown. Is, is it the 10? Here we go. He, he's at the 4. He's not at the 10. He's at the 4. Yeah. And then there were two other times in that game, and I'm not making excuses. I mean, Utah manhandled Oklahoma State. But I thought from a coaching standpoint, Gundy should have gone for the score there to go up 7 nothing, and he punted twice from midfield on fourth and one and fourth and two. I don't know. I don't know what happened to Mike Gundy on Saturday, but it should be studied because he coached that game like a wuss. Yeah, it's amazing how unproductive. Yeah, that was almost like a little Mitch Blood Green there. Like a <laughs> sissy, he ran. Right? I almost said a couple other words, but luckily wuss came right into my brain at the last minute. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have anything. I, that was a misleading final, too. Both games with their yeah. games last week, both these teams, because that was 22-3 in the competitive portion of the game. And you look up, and I turned it off, and I saw, what was it, 22-19 final? I don't yeah. I don't know how it quite got to 22-19. That was a lot of garbage time uh, production there from uh, from Oak State. I just I can't believe how little Ollie Gordon done. And uh, Jeff Schwartz talked about, you know, you, you talked about the uh, the offensive line, and maybe that's why. Uh, I, I guess that is because you don't usually talk about a college running back as like, hey, this guy's past his prime or washed up. But uh, it, it's just it's amazing to see somebody who's been this good for this long be, be just do so little here. Sammy, the question I've gotten the most so far earlier in the week is, why is Baylor favored over BYU? Pass. Pass. Uh, I have pass. nothing. I have bad quarterback, to add. bad quarterback again. Just nope. wait, don't wait for these bad quarterbacks. Just, just be um, done with it. I am passing. I am not responding to that question. I, I was just asking you an odds related question. I wasn't asking you for a pick in the game. Right, people, people are people are genuinely. See, this is the whole AP poll. They see a ranking wow. in, in front of a team, and they automatically think that that team is better than the other team. So, like, they, they don't have they don't have the understanding that. It's based on power ratings and, and the odds and getting both sides a, a two-way action and home field edge. So all, all that all that comes into it. So yeah, I get, okay. Play? On a serious note, okay, so just from a number standpoint, Baylor, I've got Baylor at a 114 and BYU at a 111. So I think the, peop, the reason people ask that question is because they watch BYU kill Kansas State and they watch Baylor lose a – heartbreaking game against Colorado. So what happened last week is absolute, correct? Eh. Results have variance. Things happen in football games. But if you just rely on your numbers, 
Baylor is better than Brigham Young in terms of power rating, and Baylor is also at home. So, yeah, Baylor's got to be a favorite here. Can you imagine if they made BYU the favorite? The Sharps, the Sharps yeah. would come in with dual handguns yeah. and take everything they could on Baylor plus three, plus two and a half, and they would literally blow it to smithereens, and you'd be at Baylor minus two. So the books know that you know what happened last Saturday in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter in totality. That's why Baylor's favored, not because you know BYU blew out Kansas State and Baylor lost. It comes down to power rating, and Baylor is still rated a smidge higher than BYU, and they're at home. Period. Baylor was at Colorado last week. Baylor should have won that game. Bear. That's why they're favored. Anybody want to want to have a uh, stab at a Big Twelve future? Anybody got anything that they're, they're I, I before the year I played both Iowa State and, and uh, UCF to win to win the league, and I, that's, I'm I'm sticking by one of those two teams to win. Uh, I want no part of Utah as, as a short shot here. No, I know Sammy likes Colorado, and he he bet in Colorado to win the Big Twelve, but I can't get behind that. Uh, my question with Baylor though, if, if Baylor's down 14, 10 points at halftime, does Aranda coach the second half? Because the way they blew that uh, Colorado game, I, I don't know how long that leash is going forward. Yeah, he, well, he, 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 uh, sorry, but the, no, the, go ahead. there was a, a point made in the telecast that he's the only head coach that calls the defense. Now, I, that's a little misleading. I think there are other coaches have, call, have parts of saying the defense, but might not call it every play. And when you're the head coach who calls the defense, and you have – guys, not only was the Hail Mary not defended correctly, remember the play before? They hit oh, the I know. Hit right receiver, in the numbers. Right in, the, right in between the numbers at the four-yard line. Like, the ball should have been down at the four-yard line with one play left to go for Colorado. And instead, so two straight plays. He called timeout and still – made a mistake on that final play with 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 the way it was defended and Sammy mentioned the guy off the edge. They got what they wanted. The guy just kind of blindly ran in, you know, in, in in the middle of defense. So when you're the head coach of a team and you're the defensive coordinator and you have those mistakes, what's the purpose of you being the coach? Like you're out of here immediately. So yeah. I, I it's even worse when you coach a side of the ball. And that side of the ball is the reason why you're losing. It's the same thing with the Brandon State of the Chargers last season. It's like he's this whiz on defense. Where's the results at? Show me the results, Sam. And they also, the name of that play, Bear, I found this out because oh, I've yeah. got a buddy at Baylor who told me that Robertson was going to play. And we talked about that on Bruce and the Bear, that Robertson was going to play over Finn. The name of that play at the end of the game, that defensive alignment, is called Victory Cigar. Oh, yeah. Whoops. Yeah. Whoops. Sorry, sorry about that. However, uh, you did get a chance to smoke the victories. Do you know that Do you know the Dartmouth fight song? <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't. They killed Fordham. We're just going to fade Fordham <laughs> to oblivion. I don't know. Last week we were saying, what's the number on a team that's been favored by 25 and 30 and has two losses? Fordham gets absolutely drilled by Dartmouth, and now Fordham has to go and play, let's see, I forget who they even play, Monmouth. 308. Yeah, you sure. 308 925 309 Fordham is probably going to be a 10-point dog, and it still might not be enough. But we, again, we don't have that number yet, so we will we will wait this out. Maybe I will text our producer, Sully, who doesn't listen to our show, and ask me for the plays. Hey, come on. Hey, hey. True. I think, we're gonna take, I think we're going to take Monmouth, and then our favorite bet in the FCS is a 308-901. Holy Cross at Syracuse. Cuse off a very tough game over the weekend. I think it was actually Friday night. Didn't they lose outright? Yeah, Syracuse? They did. Stanford. Yeah, Stanford. Yeah, Stanford. Syracuse comes out full full throttle, score forty two points, and you get at least fourteen from Holy Cross. That is fifty five right now, guys, and I think that's going to be good up to about let's call it fifty seven, fifty eight, three oh eight, nine oh one. Holy Cross, Syracuse over. We got, we, got, we got the Dartmouth game last week. We got the the Villanova Maryland over at all numbers. We, oh. we nice. Uh, Looked look a little shaky there for a while, but we we got there in the fourth, and that's all ultimately matters. So we've reached the end of another gambling group chat. Hopefully the uh, the FCS plays and everything else will come to fruition as well. Appreciate you guys. 
All right, Bear, back from again in the group chat. I can't wait for a Fordham fade to come out this week. Sammy to Texas. He texted us last week and said Dartmouth minus 11. Ugh, that number stinks, essentially like yep. that. And then none of us wagered on it, and Dartmouth was up to like 24 nothing at the end of the first half. So um, I think right now Fordham is, is auto-fade. That's why you come here, guys. Auto-fade Fordham. Uh, let's not auto-fade my, my fade of the week, Bear. These are going pretty well so far. What we're going to do this week, Bear, is we're going to have a play on big noon on, on, on your big noon game. We're going to take UCF in the first half, minus seven and a half. We're going to fade Colorado off their win against Baylor, right? A win they should not have had. We agree. Good job by Sanders making that final play. Good job by Hunter forcing that turnover. But Baylor was at the 26-yard line, Colorado 26-yard line, under four minutes left, up by seven. They should have put that game away. They, they did not. But the reason why I like the first half for UCF in this game, they're off a bye. They've had time to prepare for this game. They're going to be at home. They're going to play tempo. But Colorado Bear this season has not been a good first-half team. They're 88th in the country on first-half points, 101st in first-half defense. They do not play on the first half. What they do do well is they play well in the second half. Second-half defense, Bear, guess this. How many points do the Colorado defense allow in the second half of games so far this season? Well, they they didn't allow a point against Nebraska. I think what they shut it, they they allowed the one touchdown to North Dakota State, and they allowed the yeah. They allowed so, what? I think seven, seven to Baylor. Baylor? Yeah. Four point three points per game in the second half. They're doing a great job making adjustments. So I like UCF to come out fast in this game. Also worth noting, I am I love Colorado for a couple of reasons. One is they give us a lot of content, and one of them was that Deion Sanders had to restart practice because the energy level wasn't good. That that's a that's worrisome to me after a big win like that. So I'm gonna fade Colorado in the first half of this game. UCF off a of bye. They're at home in Orlando. They play fast. The Buffalo has not played well in the first half of, of any of these games. Not Buffalo. The Buffaloes. So give me UCF uh, minus seven and a half here as my fade of the week. We'll so we'll see what happens there from uh from Orlando with, with, with the Knights if they can get, get there in the first half for you. Uh my best bet, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, I'm going to go to uh, your alma, alma mater, and I'm going to bet over a 39-and-a-half uh, Oregon team total uh, against UCLA. Um, you know, the the, the stop-down practice, not a lot of energy. It, it almost got you last week. I know. Didn't the Bruins have to shut down practice and restart it because there wasn't a whole lot of energy uh, in Westwood last week, and then they went to oh, Baton Rouge and, and, and put up a pretty darn good fight. Uh, against LSU. LSU's but, defense, Bear, is was so bad in that first half. I thought Alex Grinch had taken over their defense. The tackling, <laughs> it was so bad. But oh. I, I would think UCLA now, off of that week where you, you're playing in hot and humid conditions and a kind of a physical type game, you come home now against Oregon, who's off of an idle week, and they played their best half of football the last time they played the field, the last time they took the field in the Civil War. Uh, against Oregon State, uh, I would expect the the Ducks to put 40 on the board uh, at the the prettiest venue in college football on January 1st, only the Rose Bowl. So, uh, Bear, I was going to ask this in the game of group chat. We, we sort of didn't get to this game. Uh, this game is at 11 p.m. Eastern, okay? For those who don't know, I live on the East Coast. Um, what are the odds I make it to the third quarter? You'll make it. It's your team. You'll you'll stay up and watch it. You'll you'll be you'll be amped after watching Alabama Georgia as well. Uh, you'll be up. My goal is to be in deep REM sleep by the time Dante Moore enters the field. So I hope that happens in early in the third quarter. The reason why I like the over in this game, to, to your, I'm going to further your point here about Oregon's offense. They play well against Oregon State, but Dante Moore is going to come in at some point in this game. And he was at UCLA last season, now at Oregon, Bear, and they don't stop the offense. Playbook will be over. Leading. They continue to play the offense. And this is what's happening in college football now with a lot of these teams that have these backup quarterbacks that are five-star kids that are good players. They just play the regular offense. It's not run the football and go home. He threw the ball three or four times against Oregon State. He threw a deep shot. It's a pass interference. Like They're going to continue to play. So uh, I like your uh, your team total here uh, over. I hope to not be awake. Honestly, better to see if this catches or not. I'll wake up in the morning and see. My best bet, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, the State University of New Jersey Let's Bear hear it. continues I'll, to make me there. money each week right now. Rutgers minus two and a half hosting Washington. Washington's first game bear outside the state of Washington, really outside of Seattle so far this season. They've been like ho-hum, right? Uh, okay, winning against Northwestern. Okay, winning against Eastern Michigan. Lost to Washington State. 
But more importantly, I just like Rutgers, Bear. They, they're good on defense. They run the football. They do enough at quarterback. I think it's a tough spot for Washington in their first road game Friday night at Rutgers. Long trip for the Huskies. I, I think Rutgers just is better. I think they're a field goal better than Washington. It's kind of that simple. So I like Rutgers here minus two and a half. I think they are too. That was a really impressive win uh, to get up at Lane Stadium last week, uh, play from play from ahead, and allowed them to do the things that they do best and run the football and uh, and and play defense. So I am uh, I'm with you there. So let's right, see if we the, uh, let's see if the see if the uh, fade the best bets and all the bets and conversations will uh, come to fruition this week. Appreciate you, everybody out there uh, watching. On the YouTube channel, make sure you to follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to that YouTube channel, the Bearbits YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be back next week to talk about how we did this week and, and what to look forward to uh, the first Saturday in October. Last week is September, first Saturday in October, coming up next week. So let's close the month strong. For Will, for Sammy P, for Jeff, I'm Bear. Less you bet, more you lose when you win.